All right, today's topic is looking at evolution and the fossil record. Now, remember, we just talked about biological classification, and remember, we ended on phylogeny. We all share genetic material because we all come from a common ancestor, which is a great jumping off point for evolution. Now, before we get started today, guys, I, I just wanted to say something. Um, I am not here to force you to believe in evolution. If you believe in creationism, that's fine. Okay? Creationism based on faith. All I ask is that you keep an open mind for today's subject. We are going to be talking about the scientific side, uh, evolution, which actually does have evidence to support it. Evolution is a theory. If you remember, uh, we talked about the scientific method earlier. So I'm not here to force you to believe what I believe. All I ask is that you keep an open mind. Now, the interesting thing is most people think that creationism and evolution are a binary choice. It has to be one or the other. Well, believe it or not, I believe in both, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that God created the first life because I still struggle with how we explain it now. And then over 3.8 billion years of life's history, life evolved. So I am a, po a portion of a growing number of scientists that don't feel it has to be science or nothing. That God or a higher being or whatever you call him or her is part. Okay, So I believe in both. God got the ball started and then we evolved. Okay. But once again, just keep an open mind for me. And so let's start by defining what organic evolution is. And I can do it in one word, change. That's really all evolution is. It's saying that biological organisms change over time. Now, a little bit better definition would be the continuous genetic adaptation of organisms to their environment through time. So our ecosystem is always changing. Remember, we talked about succession earlier on in this semester, guys. So our ecosystem is always changing. Doesn't it make sense that we would change to better fit in or adapt to that ecosystem? Now, I always like to, to start this discussion because for, for whatever reason, evolution is still a hotly debated issue. I always like to start this with a joke. And so you've seen those monkey to, to early man to now we sit behind a computer for eight hours a day. That's evolution. But I like the caption there. Somewhere something went terribly wrong. Uh, all right. Now, before we get into the real science of evolution, I, I wanted to discuss the early scientists. So the early scientists are philosophers of the 18th. Remember, the 18th century would be the 1700s, and the early 19th century would be the early 1800s. Believed that there was a God and that God had created life. So early on, guys, today we see this great gulf, this chasm between science and religion. We don't think we can have both. It has to be one or the other. But early on, that's not how it was. Most of some very, very important scientists not only believed in a god or some kind of higher divine being, but believed that they had created life. Now, I'll give you three examples here. Please don't memorize the dates. I'm simply letting you know when these scientists lived. But Robert Boyle is a very famous chemist. He experimented with the behavior of gases and has a law named after him called Boyle's Law how gases behaved under certain conditions, believed in God. Sir Isaac Newton, one of the most famous physicists, proposing his laws on gravity and motion, believed in a God. And Sir William Herschel, probably the most famous scientist you've never heard of, he's the father of modern astronomy, not astrology, astronomy. Believed in a God and that God had created life. Even Albert Einstein, guys, one of the most famous scientists of probably all time, didn't 
disprove God or, or thought that there might have been evidence for some higher being. So back in the day, guys, it, it wasn't this kind of either or situation. Science and religion often went hand in hand. I also want to give you another example of this. We're going to talk about this in our Life Through Time discussion, but did you know the originator of what is now called the Big Bang Theory was a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Lamatra. He, he proposed what is now called the uh, hypothesis of the primeval atom, which is now known as the Big Bang. Once again, proposed by a priest, ladies and gentlemen. What we, we see this kind of battle between science and religion now, but that's not how it always was. Now, also, we have to come to realize something, guys. Okay, Let's say that you're living in the 1500s, and you want to know why the sky is blue. Remember, we, we go through the scientific method to explain how the world around us works. And let's say you do that, but you can't figure it out. What do you do? Well, God made it that way, right? Okay, You can't figure something out. Oh, God, that's how God designed it. But as the natural sciences developed in the 1700s and early 1800s, we discovered things that we didn't know before. And so we didn't need that crutch to fall back on. Okay, We figured out why the sky was blue and why the planets revolved around the sun. Okay, We figured that all out. And so as the 1800s progressed, Okay, as we got into the early and later part of the 19th century, we, we saw change. And science kind of grew anti-God, anti-religion. And nowadays, there's a lot of scientists that are either atheists, don't believe in a God, or agnostic. Okay? Um, I don't really believe in anything. And so this is really where that chasm started to develop is as the natural sciences, as biology, geology, physics, and chemistry, as we made these great groundbreaking discoveries, we didn't need God to fall back on. And so we definitely had a 180 turn, and we kind of grew, sciences grew anti-God, anti-religion. Now, there's one gentleman that you may or may not have heard of that is very important to evolutionary biology. And this is a paleontologist by the name of Colvier. Now, once again, I give you those dates of when he lived. Don't Please don't memorize that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm simply letting you know when these gentlemen lived. Now, Colvier, we're going to talk about what paleontology is here in a minute. But Colvier looked at something called the fossil record. And what he discovered was that the anatomy of living organisms was different than those found in the fossil record. Think of it this way, guys. Do we have anything that looks like a Tyrannosaurus rex today? No, we do not. Okay, Closest thing would be birds, but obviously there's quite a lot of difference between them. Now, Colvier didn't realize it at the time, guys, but he just discovered the fundamental principle that Lamarckian evolution, Darwinian evolution, that evolutionary biology is built on. Life changes or evolves through time. However, here's the interesting thing, guys. Colvier didn't believe in evolution at the time. And so he made this absolutely groundbreaking discovery. But in order to explain it with something that he did believe in, he proposed what is known as the catastrophe theory. What he said was that a natural disaster, an earthquake, a fire, and a flood, would periodically kill off large plants and animals in a certain um, part of the world. So essentially, we wipe the slate clean. Okay. So this is kind of like, remember we talked about succession? This would be secondary succession. You wipe the ecosystem clean, and he said that new organisms, different organisms from other parts of the world would then migrate into that area and set up shop. And so the organisms before the natural disaster look completely different than the animals after the natural disaster. And this is how he tried to explain 
how the fossil record, how the anatomy of organisms changed through time. Now, there, he did have a following here, guys, but pretty much after Darwin got established, this, call, this catastrophe theory was widely rejected in the form of organisms evolve or change through time. Okay, so once again, I find it interesting, guys, that somebody that proved a key piece of the puzzle for evolution didn't believe in evolution and then tried to explain it away, but that was later rejected. But that anatomy was different of, of living organisms than found in the fossil record, that's the fundamental principle of evolution, guys. So he is a very important scientist. Now, Cuvier, it was a paleontology. Paleontology is a branch of geology that studies ancient life. Essentially, paleontologists study the fossil record, the preserved remains or trace of an ancient organism. And so you can see all those pictures below uh, a um, complete uh, skeleton of a T-Rex. These are called ammonites, a fish fossil, trilobites. This is probably one of the most fam famous fossils in the world. This is Archaeopteryx. Remember we talked about them in, in um, phylogeny last time. You can actually see the impressions of feathers here. This was a s so magnificently preserved fossil that you can actually see the remains or traces of feathers. And this is a bat fossil from uh, 30, 40 million years ago. Now, when it comes to fossils, there's actually different types. There are what are called body fossils, which is the actual preserved remains of an ancient organism. That top picture there is the actual body fossil of a turtle. And then we have what are called trace fossils. These are simply an indication that an ancient organism um, was there. The best example I have, and we'll talk more about trace fossils here in a little bit, but footprints. Notice those footprints that you see, uh, or those tracks, they're not part of the animal, but it's something that the animal left behind. Now, we'll talk about this here in a couple minutes, guys, but trace fossils are very important in uh, trying to determine behaviors. In the case of studying tracks, um, we can um, put together how the animal walked, how fast it could run, all of those different things. So trace fa fossils are actually very, very important in trying to put piece together behavior. But let's be honest, guys. You don't go to a fossil to see some footprints. Body fossils are the rock stars of paleontology. Now, you can actually see this top picture is a um, fish and you can actually see there's a second skeleton inside the gut. So this larger fish ate a smaller fish. Now this guy from head to tip of the tail, that's about 20 feet, guys. One of the larger forms. Here's our ammonites again. These were um, uh, ancestors of squid and octopi. Very, very common during the Mesozoic, during the time of the dinosaurs, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. This is the entrance to the LA Natural History Museum, guys. If you've ever been there, uh, I highly recommend going. Uh, but we have the um, skeleton of a T-Rex uh, battling a Triceratops. Let's go back to these trace fossils, though, because there's actually quite a lot here that paleontologists study. So once again, from tracks, we can determine you know, speeds, running speeds, how the animal walked, were they bipedal, quadrupedal, all of those things. Uh, we can look at eggs and nests to determine was the animal a good parent? Did the animal stay around after the egg was hatched to take care of the young? Once again, behavioral patterns. Now these gastrolists that you see down here, I, I, a lot of you are probably thinking they look like river stones smooth stones worn away by the, the action of waves over time. Well, that's not the case. And if you've ever seen a modern day chicken, you'll notice that chickens swallow gravel. That gravel actually aids the chicken in the digestion of that tough vegetation material. 
Well, large herbivore dinosaurs did the same thing. So think of a brachiosaurus, okay? These large seropods, they would periodically swallow sharp stones and they'd put in, in their gut. And then as they ate that, their vegetation, that stone would help them break up that tough vegetation material. So that over time, those sharp stones would become smooth and well-rounded. Now when that happened, the animal would simply excrete the stones out and swallow more stones uh, again. And then we have these actual fossilized gastrolis. These are these gut stones. And then this last picture, I know it's icky, guys, but we have the study of something called coprolites or fossilized feces. Now, I know that sounds like a horrible time to spend your whole day looking at poop, but we can tell a lot, of, a great deal about an organism, especially its diet, by looking at the excreted uh, remains. The other interesting thing about coprolites is they were actually able to correlate um, body temperature with how much mass the actual animal ate. And so there's that saying back um, during the infancy of, of paleontology, we thought dinosaurs were slow, cold moving, exothermic animals that essentially would have to live in swamps to support their large bulk. Well, it was actually um, other parts of paleontology, but was looking at copper lights to realize that dinosaurs were closer to mammals. They were probably endothermic able to maintain a constant body temperature. Uh, and so we were able to, to determine behavior. Looking at these coprolites was one part of that discussion. Uh, here are some more trace fossils. We have burrows on the left-hand side. So marine organisms living on the bottom of the ocean would burrow into the sediments and they'd leave those behind. Or trails. The picture on the right hand side as the animal moved across once again the bottom of the ocean floor it left behind that trail in place and so trace fossils even though it doesn't sound that exciting uh, are very important in paleontology in determining past behaviors okay how they how they moved what kind of parents were they uh, metabolism all those different things now in order to create a fossil we go through a process called fossilization. And as an organism dies, we need two things to happen relatively quickly, guys. We need it to be rapidly buried, that's that carcass, and we need a low oxygen environment. Now, the more time that that carcass is exposed to the elements or scavengers, the more easily it will be torn apart and any trace of that animal will be lost, okay? So if we hope to create a fossil, rapid burial in a low oxygen environment. And the reason we want low oxygen is oxygen is a very reactive element, guys. And so if we have a lot of oxygen around the skeleton, it will chemically break down the bones, okay? So rapid burial, low oxygen environment. Now, if we get those two things, we have a shot of creating a fossil. What will happen is as we bury the carcass, the soft tissue will decay first. So organs, skin, and hair, all of that will rot. Now, there have been some instances where hair or skin has been preserved. Mainly that's been in ice. So very, very cold climates where we can actually preserve those things. Mostly the soft tissue rots fairly easily. And what you're left behind is the hard parts, teeth and bones. Now, over hundreds of thousands, millions of years, water, groundwater, water that exists in the subsurface, actually will move through the skeleton. And it will dissolve the bone, which is actually fairly fractured, or fairly, um, fragile guys. If you've ever broken a bone, you know how fragile they can be. So this groundwater dissolves the bone and instead replaces it with minerals or solid rock. 
this, re this process is often called replacement, where you're replacing the bones with solid rock. And the rock is strong enough to survive the millions of years between the animal lived and when we actually find the skeleton. So when you go to a museum and are looking at these, um, these skeletons, you're not looking at bone anymore, guys. You're looking at solid rock, okay? Because bone is fairly fragile. All right, now let's kind of jump in with both feet to our evolutionary discussion. And let's talk about the first evolutionary biologist, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Once again, don't memorize those dates, simply letting you know when this gentleman lived. He was the first to propose his ideas on evolution, and he proposed something called transmutation, that physical characteristics were acquired by continued use or disuse. Now let's take giraffe, which Lamarck actually used it in his example. Believe it or not, guys, one of the first giraffes actually had a short, stubby neck. Now, here's what Lamarck would say. Its food supply is up here in the higher branches of trees. And so this guy would have been constantly straining his neck up, 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 and up. So that what transmutation is, as all of that stretching eventually passed down the genes for a longer neck in subsequent generations. And so you can see as we go through giraffe evolution, their necks got longer. This is this transmutation. Now Lamarck said that these new traits could be inherited by future generations due to an inner need. Okay, so if you needed something, more hair, longer legs, a longer neck, you could pass those genes on to your offspring. Uh, your offspring. Now, Lamarck evolution doesn't get a lot of credit, guys, because he really doesn't give a mechanism here. Okay, think about what Lamarck's saying. If you needed something, you pass the genes on. Okay, well, how? He doesn't give a mechanism. He doesn't really explain how. He just says if you need something, if you're continually using something or continually not using something, that will cause changes in the anatomy from generation to generation. Okay, But he was the first. And so Lamarckian evolution is important. But when it comes to, to evolutionary biology, guys, here's the rock star, Charles Darwin. Now, here's the interesting thing. As a young man, Darwin was actually part of a scientific expedition to the Galapagos Islands. And it is during this time that he will make two very, very important observations that will lead him to his ideas on evolution. Number one. No two members of a single species are exactly identical. There is an exception to that, guys. If you come from the same fertilized egg, this is how we get identical twins. Okay, But Darwin wasn't looking at humans. He was looking at crickets and finches and tortoises. And he noticed, you know, most of us, if we had two crickets side by side, ah, they're identical. But they're not, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Everything within a single species shows some variability. Now, here's the important part. Those variable characteristics could be passed down from parent to offspring, okay? So once again, um, if we talk about longer legs or a bigger beak, all of these, that variability is inheritable. That was number one. Number two is Darwin noticed that populations produce more offspring than needed for maintenance. Here's what maintenance is, guys. Maintenance is if a population stays the same through time. So it's not increasing, it's not decreasing, it's staying at the same level. So Darwin noticed that a population doesn't maintain itself. We produce more offspring. Now here's the key part, guys. 
at the very core of Darwinian evolution is the process of competition. That's what Darwinian evolution is all about. You produce all of these offspring, they're going to have to compete with one another for food, water, shelter, even a mating partner, guys. And this competition is going to produce winners and it's going to produce losers. And we'll talk about what that means here in a couple minutes. But those are the two key observations. Now, it's almost going to be three decades before Darwin finally puts his ideas down on paper and is published in the now famous The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. This is where he proposed his ideas on evolution. Now, Darwinian evolution can be summed up in one sentence. Survival of the fittest by means of natural selection. Now, I want to take both parts, guys. So let's start with the first half of that. What does survival of the fittest mean? Okay, well, let's go back to competition. All of those offspring are going to compete with one another. Now, let's say that one or two of those offspring have a favorable physical trait. Okay, the trait is not important, guys could be longer legs, a bigger brain, more hair. It's not important. But those one or two offspring have it. And they're able to outcompete all their brothers and sisters. They're the winners, guys. So that physical trait allows them to outcompete everybody else. They're the winners. Here's what winning means. You reach reproductive age and you produce multiple offspring, often with multiple partners. Okay, So you can pass your favorable traits down. That makes sense, right? Okay, And you're, you attract all those mates because of those favorable characteristics. They see your traits and say, ah, that's somebody I should be having sex with and producing offspring. Now let's say that you're the, the other offspring that don't have that key physical trait. You're the losers, guys. Now, losing means that A, you may not even reach reproductive age. So you die without having sex. Or B, you reach reproductive age, but are you going to be attractive to the opposite sex? You are not. And so you're going to produce zero offspring or a limited number of offspring. So the difference between winning and losing from a Darwinian perspective is the number of offspring produced. The winners, they're the ones producing all the offspring, while the losers are not. That's the survival of the fittest. Okay? Remember, all driven by competition. Competition is the driving force of Darwinian evolution. Now let's take the second half of that. Let's talk about his mechanism which is dubbed natural selection. Now, natural selection is a process by which favorable traits become more common from generation to generation, and less favorable traits are essentially bred out of a population. So let's go back to the winners, guys, and let's say that their physical trait is longer legs. And so, as we go from generation to generation to generation to generation, we're going to notice that all the offspring, or most of the offspring, are going to have those longer legs. And so the entire population, because remember the winners are producing all the offspring, most of the population is going to have those longer legs that give them a leg up, so to speak, on their other brothers and sisters. So this is what natural selection is. It's his mechanism. And that should make logical sense, guys. If the winners are producing all the offspring, then they're going to have the physical traits that gave them an advantage in the first place. Now, to sum this up, guys, let's go back to our ever-changing ecosystem. Remember, that's what evolution is based on. If our ecosystem is always changing, we have to change to adapt. Here's what Darwin is saying, is that certain individuals are more successful when faced with a changing environment than others. 
and it's the ones that can adapt the quickest, they're the ones that are going to survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. Now let me give you an example of this, okay? Let's say at the uh, uh, Arctic Circle, North Pole, that we have a population of polar bears. Now some individuals in that population have a thick fur coat and others have a thin fur coat. Now let's fast forward to today guys where global warming is a very serious issue. We'll talk about this later on in the semester. Which members would be an at, at an advantage? Well, the ones with the thinner fur coat would, able, would be able to cope with a warming Arctic area better, yes? That's it, and that's it, guys. So the thinner fur coats now are at an advantage. The thicker fur coats are at a disadvantage. So the thinner fur coat individuals, they're able to adapt to their changing environment faster. The thick fur coats, they go extinct, guys, because they can't adapt quick enough. That's what Darwinian evolution is. Survival of the fittest by means of natural selection. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier on, guys, evolution is a theory. Let's go back to our discussion on the scientific method and remember what a theory is. It's something that has evidence. And so what I want to do now is I want to go through five of what I consider to be the most important pieces of evidence for evolution. Now let me make something clear guys, okay? There are actually dozens of pieces of evidence for evolution, but some of them you have to be a biologist to understand. And so I'm going to go through five of the more easily understandable pieces of evidence for evolution. Remember, theory accepted as scientific fact in the community because it has evidence. Now let's go back to our phylogeny discussion, guys. Remember we talked about how everything shares genetic material with everything else. Now think about it this. If we all come from a common ancestor, and I, I hope you've thought about that, guys. If we all come from a common ancestor, then shouldn't we have similar anatomical traits? The answer is we do, guys. They're called homologous structures, our first piece of evidence. These are body parts of similar origin, similar structure, and similar development, but have evolved for very different purposes, depending on what the organism need. Now, I have four examples over here, guys. We're going to look at the limb structure of four organisms. The first one here, this is a, a flying reptile called a pterodon. Modern bird, modern bat, modern homo sapien. Okay. Now notice, look at the, f the, the limb structure here, 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 and here. Do you see similarities? Yes, you do. I'm not asking are they identical, I'm asking if you see similarities, and the answer is yes. So we know all four of those organisms had a common ancestor. Now, let's take a look at the, the first three organisms on this list, guys. What do they use their four limb structures for? For flight. Can we fly with our hands? No. We use our four limb structures to grasp and pick up things. So body parts of similar origin, structure, and development, but evolve for very different purposes. Now let me give some more examples here, guys. Let's take a look at the forelimb skeletons of some modern mammals. So going from left to right, we have a bird, a bat, a whale, a horse, and a human. And once again, if you look at those structures, I'm not asking are they identical, because they're not, but do you see similarities? Yeah, you do. Now we've just talked about the bird and the bat use their forelimbs for flight. What does a whale use its for? Swimming. A horse for running, walking, and a human for picking things up or grasping things. So five organisms, guys, but four different uses for their forelimb structures. These are homologous structures. Our second piece of evidence comes from something that we've already talked about today, the fossil record. Now, here's the interesting thing, guys. Okay, 
we can take a look at a, 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 a look at a group of, of closely related animals and when we put them in chronological order okay so this species came first this next next so on and so forth we can actually see how the physical anatomical structures have changed so what we see here guys is this is actually the we're going to talk more about the evolution of horses later but this is the evolution of, of horses so this was the first horse that shows up about 55 60 million years ago um, he's very small size of a house cat guys and so as the as we've gone through in time horses have gotten a lot bigger and so their forelimb structures notice we can see changes so here's an early horse here's a recent horse notice we see changes in both skeleton and in both or i'm um, skull and in other parts of the skeleton here is a, a, a more examples of this this is whale evolution so what you see up here this is one of the earliest whales once again you're probably looking at something uh 50 55 million years ago now believe it or not guys the first whales actually lived on land so you'll notice that this skeleton looks a lot different than a modern whale okay and so notice we've seen very great changes so somewhere around here they moved into the ocean and you can see how the skeleton is changing in response to that so once again we put them in chronological order and we can physically see the anatomical changes our third piece of evidence deals with something called vestigial organs these are reduced or useless structures in plants and animals that may have served a purpose in our early ancestors now there's two examples from humans both the human appendix and the human coccyx or tailbone so we you have an organ in your body called the appendix what does the appendix do nothing absolutely nothing okay it doesn't filter out waste it it does nothing guys it's absolutely useless the only thing it can do is burst and cause you in, incredible amounts of pain where you're rushed to the hospital now may this organ have been useful in our early homo ancestors yeah maybe it was useful in them but over our evolutionary course it became useless in us the other example is our coccyx so you have a tailbone um, at, at the very base of your spine now do we need a tailbone do we have tails the answer is no but if you look at our closest living ancestors the monkeys do they need a tailbone yes they do so as we split off from the evolutionary line of apes we inherited this trait that we really don't need and once again the only thing you can do is break or crack causing us a tremendous amount of pain now the other example is from whales and this goes back to what i was just talking about guys the first whales lived on land okay would they have needed a pelvis yeah they would have okay they needed to stand upright against the effects of gravity do current whales need a pelvis no they do not and so notice that in both of these pictures guys here's the pelvis here here's it here is it connected to any other parts of the skeleton it is not it's useless in the first whales that lived on land it would have been useful but as they entered the, the marine environment the tailbone became absolutely useless on them now our fourth piece of evidence deals with the branch of science called biochemistry which is the study of chemical processes that occur within living organisms now here's the piece of evidence guys I'm gonna call this biochemical similarities okay now what I mean by that is the metabolism of vastly different organisms is based on the same biochemical compounds so uh, if we look at all the animals today guys we'll notice that there are biochemical compounds that are shared between a wide variety of organisms that are not closely related 
Okay, and so once again, that goes back to that common ancestor that passed it down. Now, the example I'm going to use here are similar proteins. Now, if you don't remember your high school bio class, I don't, um, a protein is a string of amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. We have four major amino acids that every living organism is built on. Okay, so think of these proteins as simply these strings of these building blocks of life. And I want to look at one protein in particular, something called cytochrome. This is a protein found in blood of all organisms that use cellular respiration. So we breathe in oxygen, we take energy from digested foods, and we breathe out CO2. Okay? Remember, it's cellular respiration is the opposite of photosynthesis. So cytochrome is found in any organism that breathes in O2 and breathes out CO2. Now, once again, guys, let, let's go back um, and talk about humans and banana plants. Okay, or uh, let, let's go um, humans and mosquitoes. Both of us breathe in oxygen and expel CO2. Not a lot of similarities as far as physical, but we have cytochrome in our bodies. And once again, good piece of evidence to suggest that common ancestor had cytochrome and passed it on as we descended from it. So I like to call this fourth piece of evidence biochemical similarities or similar biochemical compounds found in a wide variety of living organisms. Now I've saved the best for the last guys. Okay, What I consider the most compelling piece of evidence in evolution is this. The early embryonic development of vastly different organisms is spectacularly similar okay we have eight organisms here guys okay this is early development mid development so what the embryo looks like mid development and late development so we have a fish salamander tortoise chick pig calf rabbit and human now ignore the rest here guys look at that first line if i hadn't labeled them could you tell the tortoise from the human or the calf from the fish I can't now obviously in the mid developmental stages you'll start to see some of the changes and the changes are very prevalent in the late stages here guys but think about this why would a human look like a salamander early on in its embryonic development unless we all come from a same common ancestor, guys. It all goes back to phylogeny, that common ancestry. If we look at it that way, then that makes sense. That common ancestor, we're descended from that common ancestor, and so we see some of these similarities. Now, I only talked about five pieces. As I said before we started this, there are dozens of pieces of evidence, okay? Uh, in genetics, in DNA, in, in a lot of different sciences, but I thought these were the five most compelling. Okay, so number one, homologous structures. Number two, the fossil record, looking at how life has changed through time by putting them in order. Number three, vestigial organs. Number four, similar biochemical compounds or biochemical similarities. And number five, early embryonic development. Okay? All very compelling pieces of evidence. And remember, evolution is a theory, guys. It's not a hypothesis, it's a theory. It has been proven and it is generally accepted as fact in the scientific community. Now, can it be disproven at a further time? Maybe. I don't see it being disproven, but it can be. It hasn't reached law status yet. Now, there's a lot of other processes occurring in evolution that are very important that I want to talk about. And the first one we're going to bring up is genetics. Okay? And we can't talk about genetics without talking about the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. 
Now, here's what Mendel did. And once again, don't memorize those dates, guys. Just letting you know when these scientists lived. What Mendel did is he took the common pea plant and he crossbred it over multiple generations. And he discovered that certain traits showed up in the offspring without any blending of parent characteristics. Let's look at this logically, guys. Okay? It took a, a Mendel took a male and a female pea plant and bred them. Now, the obvious expectation is the offspring of those two parents would be a blending of the characteristics of both of the parents. That's what Mendel was expecting. But he noticed some traits were not. So you, you are a combination or a collection of different traits from eye color to hair color to, to body features. Now, some of your traits may be a blending of both your mother and your father, but other traits come through from one or the other parent. So has anybody ever told you, oh, you have your mother's eyes? Well, maybe you do. Or you have your father's ass. I don't know what people tell you, okay? It may be true. So maybe you get um, traits from your mother, you get traits from your father, and other traits are a blending of characteristics. This is what Mendel found out, and this is now known as Mendel's Law of Inheritance. Now, if you remember back to your high school biology class, this is when we talk about pundit squares or probabilities. So I have two pundit squares over here, guys. The first one is the geometry of the seeds. We have round seeds and wrinkled seeds. So in this case, the round seeds are what are called the dominant trait. The wrinkled seeds are what are called the recessive trait. So you get the two parents together, you get dominant and dominant comes together, recessive and recessive comes together. By the way, the big R, that's the dominant, the small R, that's the recessives. So the two dominants come together, the two recessives come together, and then you have a mix of dominant and recessive and dominant and recessive. So this is, if you remember, your, this is where we get into probability. So if you have two parents, you're gonna have a, a, about a 75% probability that you will have a round seed and about a 25% probability that you'll get one of these wrinkled seeds. So these are these pundit squares or probability. That's what genetics is, guys. It's all about probability. Um, I have another one down here. This is, once again, um, we have, this is color, uh, flower color. So purple or white. In this case, the purple is the dominant, the white is the recessive. So once again, you have the two parents, dominant, recessive, dominant, recessive. The two dominants get together, the two recessives get together, and then you get a combination of dominant and recessive. Let me talk a little bit more about this, guys, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. Let's say that you have two parents that are both blonde. The child that they are going to produce is more likely going to be blonde, but they can produce uh, a black-haired child or a red-haired child. Let's say that we have two blonde parents, and they were both carrying the red-headed hair gene recessively. They got together, and the recessive gene expressed itself. So you can actually have two blonde parents that produce a red-headed child. Is it common? No. But the probability is there. Now, when I used to discuss this in my early classes, I would always have a student that says, no, that just means there's a red-headed mailman. No, we don't need a red-headed mailman, guys. Okay? The difference between dominant and recessive genes. Okay? This is also, let's say that we have two parents, both have blue eyes. The offspring more than likely is going to have blue eyes, but can they come out with brown or green? Of course. This is simply those recessive genes getting expressed. Another example of this, if you've ever heard of sickle cell anemia, a horrible disease, guys. Now, you can have two healthy parents don't have sickle cell anemia, but they both carry the gene recessively. And so they get together, and unfortunately, the recessive gene is expressed and now you have a child that does have sickle, sickle cell anemia. This is all about genetics, guys. And so genetics, it's all about probabilities. As 
the certain physical characteristics. Are they going to be a blending of both parents or are they going to come through without any blending from one or the other parent? So genetics, very, very important in evolution. Now, this next process we're going to talk about gets a bad reputation. Mutation, believe it or not, is actually very important, evolutionarily speaking. Okay. Now, we're going to define it as the permanent change in genetic material which can be inherited. So, it, uh, simply mutation is a change in genetic material that can be passed from parent to offspring. Now, these mutations or changes create variations in the gene pool. Now, large mutations are often non-advantageous and are often removed by natural selection. Now, when I mean by large mutations, guys, these are usually not produced through evolutionary processes, but can be produced through radiation or chemicals. Okay, Think Chernobyl, guys. After the 1986 accident at Chernobyl, um, there were children born in that area that uh, I've seen a picture where one boy actually had a second head growing out of his neck. Or uh, another picture of a small girl that had a third withered arm growing out of her chest. Those are large mutations, large changes, okay? They're not advantageous, and so they're often quickly removed from the gene pool, okay? We don't want large mutations, guys. We want small mutations because these permit entirely new traits to appear, and because they're inheritable, spread throughout a population, and that's what results in evolutionary change. Let me give you the best example of this, guys. Anthropologists now think that the first Homo sapien had brown skin, brown hair, and brown eyes. And so eye color, hair color, skin color, we had small mutations. And so now we have um, blonde, um, black, red, all these different hair colors, different eye colors, different skin colors. That's because of small mutations. So on an evolutionary scale, we need mutation, small mutations, small changes. We don't want the big changes. We want the small changes because they produce variability. And that variability, remember, is inheritable, can be passed down from parent to offspring. Now. I have been using the term species for a while and I haven't given you a definition. Let's do this now, guys. Species are a group of individuals. Remember, species was the, the, um, mo the uh, most specific level of our Linnaean system of classification, kingdom to species. A species is a group of individuals capable of interbreeding, and here's the important part and producing fertile offspring. You can only produce fertile offspring with other sapiens. Now here's the interesting thing, guys. There is evidence that our early ancestors, like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthals, actually bred amongst each other. So we had Homo erectus breeding with Homo sapiens. Now, could they produce offspring? Yes. But, by the very definition, their offspring would have been infertile because you can't breed outside of your species designation and produce fertile offspring. Now, let me give you some more examples. I know you've heard of a liger, guys. A lion, the offspring of a lion and a tiger. Two completely different species. So, when that liger cub is born, it is by its very nature infertile and cannot produce cubs. How do we produce more liger cubs? A lion and a tiger have to get together. Okay. Or a donkey, guys. A donkey or a mule or a jackass, and that's not a curse word, that's what it's called, is a combination of a, or I'm sorry, a jackass is a combination of a horse and a donkey getting together. So, you can breed outside of your species and produce offspring, 
but they are by their very nature infertile. Okay? You can only breed with members within your own species. Now, speciation is the origin of a new species from two or more individuals of a pre-existing one. Think about it this way, guys. We started with one species on Earth. We now have millions of species. How did we go from one to millions? That's this speciation, where you take members of an existing species and you create a new species from them. And there are two speciation processes that we'll talk about here in a minute, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Now, let's talk about the differences. And let's start with allopatric speciation. In allopatric speciation, this is often called geographic or physical isolation. In this case, let's say that we start with a population of monkeys that belong to a single species. Okay? And through plate tectonics, something we've discussed in this class, guys, we create a mountain range that splits the group in half. So you have half of the monkeys on one side of the mountain range and half of the monkeys on the other side. And let's say that monkeys can't climb mountains. I'm pretty sure they can't, but let's, for our example, let's say they can't. And so you have half breeding with on one side and half breeding on the other side. So that given enough time, these speciation events take time, ladies and gentlemen. But if given enough time, you will produce two brand new species that are completely different from the species that they started with. So that even if you remove the physical barrier, okay, let's say that, that we wore the mountains down through erosion and that the two groups got together again, they couldn't breed amongst themselves anymore because now they are two brand new species. Okay, So remember, this is geographic or physical isolation. You're putting some kind of barrier between the members of the species. The other type is sympatric speciation. This is a process by which a new species evolves from a single ancestral species living in the same geographic region. This is often called biological isolation. Now this is a little bit harder to see, so let's do an example, guys. Let's say that, once again, I like to say monkeys, so let's take another group of monkeys that are living on the Saharan Plains, so in Africa. And what develops is the formation of what are called subgroups. Now, here's the interesting thing, and, and if you remember your high school days, guys, and remember the word clicks, this should come as no surprise, okay? So, in high school, you remember there were the uh, football clicks, the cheerleading clicks, the goth click, and the nerd click, okay? The same thing is happening, guys. So, these subgroups form, and it's interesting, one group could be 10 feet away from the other, but they want nothing to do with one another. So there's no physical barriers. There's simply these imposed biological isolation. One subgroup wants nothing to do with the other subgroups. So in the case of the cliques, guys, you got the football monkeys breeding with the football monkeys, the cheerleading monkeys breeding with the cheerleading monkeys, the golf monkeys breeding with the golf monkeys, and the nerd monkeys breeding with the nerd monkeys. So we started with one single species, we had four subgroups develop, and then, once again, if given enough time, we will have created four brand new species that even if they wanted something to do with the others, they could not breed with them and produce fertile offspring. This is sympatric speciation. And this is fascinating with me, guys. We always think of humans as being evolved or above animals. We are not the only animals where these cliques or subgroups develop. Very common in primates, guys. Okay, Maybe that's where we got it from. But these subgroups want nothing to do with one another. They will ignore each other 
They will not breed with members of other subgroups. And so you get this biological isolation occurring. That's sympatric. All right. Now, believe it or not, there are different viewpoints or different mechanisms on how we think evolution occurs. And we're going to talk about the two main ones here, guys. There's something called phyletic gradualism, which Darwin proposed, says that we're always evolving, but evolution is slow and continuous. And there's something that was actually proposed by two paleontologists, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge in the early 70s as kind of a criticism of their traditional Darwinian ev uh, phyletic gradualism called punctuated equilibrium that states that, no, we're not always evolving. For most of our time, we're not changing. Okay? Now, I, I want to make this clear, guys. Th there's no right or wrong answer here. These are just different viewpoints on how we evolve. Okay, so if you accept we evolve, these are just simply mechanisms or different viewpoints on how we do it. And there are proponents of both. There are people that believe in phyletic gradualism and there are scientists that believe in punctuated equilibrium. Okay, there's no right or wrong answer, just different ways on how we evolve. Now, let's look at phyletic gradualism first. And let's go back to our um, tree of life here, guys. And so what we have here is a plot of time on the x-axis, and I'm sorry, time on the y-axis, and morphology or change of form on the uh, x-axis. Now, in this case, guys, going from generation to generation to generation to generation, there's very little change. Okay. So in the case of phyletic gradualism, which was, once again, proposed by Darwin, Darwin guys essentially you can sum this up by saying that evolution is always occurring but it occurs at a very very slow rate and so if you were to put a parent and offspring side by side you couldn't tell the difference because the change from one offspring to another or one generation to another is very very minor okay but once again summary evolution is slow but continuous those three words guys slow but continuous that's what gradualism is okay but you can't really see the physical differences unless you look at hundreds of generations removed okay slow but constant that's what darwin believed our our environment is always changing therefore we always have to evolve to fit in now this was pretty much the only viewpoint until in 1972. Once again, these two paleontologists by the names of Niles Eldridge and Stephen J. Gould. Now, by the way, both of those paleontologists are well-respected top of their field. Stephen J. Gould, along with Robert Backer, are probably the two most famous and most well-respected paleontologists of their time. So we're not talking about this thing being proposed by scrubs. We're talking about this being proposed by well-respected members of, the, um, of their community. And they proposed this as a criticism of the traditional Darwinian viewpoint. Now, they said that most species will not change. They'll show no change, what is called stasis, over most of their time. And then something in the environment triggers a very abrupt, sudden, brief period of change. Now, once that change happens, if you put the offspring and the parent side by side, the change is so major that you can tell the difference. Now, let's go back to our tree of life here, guys. Once again, time on the Y, morphology on the X. Here's how you read this. Here's the original parent. As it's going through time, nothing's happening. No change, no evolution, nothing's happening. And then, boom! A brief burst of intense change. Notice, that's a large change of form, guys. Morphology there. 
So parent offspring, big change. Now we continue along. No evolution, nothing's happening, and then boom! Another environmental factor forces another brief burst of intense change. This is punctuated equilibrium. So phyletic gradualism, evolution is slow, continuous, always happening. In punctuated equilibrium, they're pretty much saying the opposite. We're re we really are not evolving for most of our time. Something in the environment triggers a brief burst of change and we're forced to adapt. Remember what Darwin says, guys. If our environment changes, we are forced with two decisions. We adapt or we die. That's essentially here. So something in the environment, something in our ecosystem forces, triggers that intense change. Now, if we put both of these side by side, okay, here is the differences between the two viewpoints. So here's phyletic gradualism, guys. In this case, here's the original parent, and it's going along small changes, always evolving, but the changes are minor from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. So once again, you put the parent and the offspring up there, and there's very little change. You can't tell the difference. Okay, Slow but continuous, guys. Remember, slow but continuous. Here's punctuated equilibrium. Here's the original parent. No change. Nothing's happening. No evolution. And then, boom! Brief burst of intense change. Notice, parent, offspring. Can you tell the difference? Hell yeah, you can tell the difference. The parent continues along, on, along its path. No change, no evolution, nothing's happening. Boom! Another brief burst of intense change. Parent, offspring, major change. Okay. Now, as I said when we started this, guys, there's no right or wrong answer. These are different viewpoints on how we evolve. My opinion, I lean towards punctuated equilibrium, but that's just my opinion, guys. Okay. If you're a supporter of Darwin, then you would lean towards phyletic gradualism. No right or wrong answer, just different ways on how we do evolve. Now, there's a couple other things that I want to talk about before we finish our discussion on evolution. And I'm going to call these la this last section evolutionary trends. And the first one we're going to talk about is a process called convergent evolution. This is the process by which organisms that are not closely related independently evolve similar traits because they live in a similar environment. Okay, And I have a couple of examples here, guys. Let's take these three organisms here, a hawk, uh, a bat, and a butterfly. Okay, Are they closely related? No, they are not. But do you see physical similarities? Yes, I do because they have adapted to living uh, in a similar environment. They're adapted to flying. Another example here is a shark and a dolphin. Once again, not closely related animals, but do you see similarities? Yes, I do, because they live in a similar environment. So convergent evolution is the evolution of similar traits because you live in a similar environment. On the other hand, we have divergent evolution. This is where we evolve very different physical forms because we live in different environments. So I have a couple of examples here. This first one, we, we take the first ancestral mammal. So the first mammal that gave rise to all other mammals. And we have armadillos, jaguars, cows, and giraffes. Do they look similar? No, they do not because they live in different environments, okay? Same thing here. From this early um, small um, mammalian ancestor, we give rise to all these others, very different physical traits. So convergent evolution is the evolution of similar traits. Divergent evolution is the evolution of very different traits. Our next evolutionary trend is something called Cope's Rule. Now, Cope's Rule states that body size increases during the evolutionary path. 
Now, think about why a bigger body would make evolutionary sense, okay? You can fight off predators more easily. You can capture prey more easily. You can resist changes in your ecosystem better. That is not to say that a big body is always evolutionary advantageous, guys. And not every animal, not every species has followed Cope's rule. The best example I can give you of this is horses. So this is the first horse, Eohippus, about 55, 60 million years ago. Okay, It's the size of a small cat. You could have taken Eohippus, put it on your lap, and stroked it and gone, nice horsey, nice horsey. And over 60 million years of evolution, guys, what has happened? The body size of horses have increased. Okay, You can't take Epicenter, uh, who I think just won a, a horse race, and put him on your lap and stroke it and say, nice horsey, nice horsey. You can't do that. So horses have followed Cope's rule. Humans have also followed Cope's rule, guys. If you look at uh, early Homo ancestors, Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, not only has our height increased, but our skeletal girth has increased as well. So you could say that humans have followed Cope's rule. Now, once again, this does not hold true for all species. There are a lot of um, insects, guys, that have actually done the opposite. So if you want to look at one of the first spiders that shows up, oh, I want to say 300, 350 million years ago, uh, was the size of like a golden lab, Labrador Retriever. And spiders have shrunk through their evolutionary process, thank God. Okay, and now there's a reason for that. We, I actually get into that in our life through time discussion, but it had to do with oxygen content. The atmosphere had a much higher oxygen content back then. This allowed insects with exoskeletons to support larger sizes. And as the animals moved on to land and started feeding on the plants, oxygen levels decreased and insects were forced to get smaller. Once again, thank God. Okay. Um, next, let's go to what is known as an evolutionary radiation. This is a rapid expansion of a species or a group of species over a relatively short period of time. Now, I haven't stated this, guys, but when we talk about evolution, relatively short is still millions of years. Okay, We don't talk about evolution occurring over one generation or ten generations. It occurs over thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of generations. Okay? Evolution, slow guts. Even in punctuated equilibrium, those brief bursts of intense change, brief would still be hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. So, short period of time is still relatively long uh, for us. Now, these radiations can be caused by two things. First, we have what are known as adaptive breakthroughs. This would be the appearance of a key feature, a physical feature, that allows that species to succeed. And so they get whatever that, that physical feature is, they outcompete everybody else, and as they outcompete everybody else, their numbers explode. Or caused by an extinction event. We're going to talk about mass extinctions, will be our last topic here in a couple minutes. But the disappearance of one species can present opportunities for another one. For example, guys, there is fossil evidence that mammals actually show up before dinosaurs did. And so during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, both mammals and dinosaurs existed, but dinosaurs outcompeted our early and mammalian ancestors. And so they stayed small, burrowing creatures. 65 million years ago, we wiped the slate clean, guys. We get rid of all the dinosaurs, and this allowed the mammals to come into power. And as they came into power, their numbers exploded. This is an evolutionary radiation, okay? Most commonly caused by an adaptive breakthrough or by an extinction event. Now, I'm going to give you an example that was caused by neither an extinction event or a adaptive breakthrough. What we have here, guys, are three groups of flying insects. 
Okay, and somewhere in this pink area of time, we think the first flowering plants actually appeared. And so notice how their numbers are fairly, the width of that is how many species they had. Pop, pop, pop. In this case, we think that all three groups, uh, that those evolutionary radiations were caused by the appearance of a new group, by a new food source, essentially, guys, our flowering plants. And this allowed their numbers to explode. All right, our last topic, guys, are mass extinctions. This is the widespread disappearance or death of large numbers of plants and animals. And mass extinction events are a common phenomenon. We can have minor extinction events where we wipe out a small amount of, of plants and animals, or we can have what are called major mass extinction events. Uh, depending on, on how, many, how you define minor or major, there have been five major mass extinction events through time. The last one coming about uh, 11,000 years ago with the extinction of the large mammals, the woolly mammoths, the mastodons, the saber-toothed cats, all of those. Dinosaurs would be a major mass extinction event. Now, there are common causes that have caused one or multiple mass extinction events in the past. The first one is a uh, impact with a, a large rocky body, either an asteroid or a meteor. Now, really the difference between those two are size, guys. Asteroids are, are large chunks of rocks, meteors are smaller chunks of rocks. But think about a stray chunk of rock, think about the, the movie Armageddon, guys, Bruce Willis, okay? A, even a small chunk of rock, if it hits the Earth's surface, it creates essentially nuclear winter. It would throw up a tremendous amount of dust. Sunlight would be blocked for years. Our autotrophs would die, which would then cause the collapse of the entire ecological pyramid. Primary consumers would die. Secondary consumers would die. Tertiary consumers would die. Uh, climate change, either a period of global warming or global cooling. Now, here's the interesting thing, guys. Of the five major mass extinction events, three have been caused by climate change. So that's probably the most common. Why should that worry us? Well, what are we going through today? Climate change, global warming, guys. In fact, the largest extinction event that ever occurred at the end of the Permian period was caused by global warming, which should worry the hell out of us, guys. Plate tectonics. Um, we talked a little bit about this. It can alter climate. So plate tectonics can actually cause warming or cooling periods. It can also trigger volcanic activity, which ca can have an impact on climate as well. And then changes in the oceanic environment. Uh, either a fall in sea level, changes in oceanic circulation. Remember we talked about how currents change as the plates have moved across the face of the Earth. Uh, and even a decrease in the oxygen content of, of oceans. This is a process called anoxia. All of those on that list have been responsible for either minor or major mass extinction events in the past. Especially the earlier ones, guys. Before life moved onto land, when, when life was confined into the oceanic realm, a, even a small change in the environment could have massive effects on the organisms that were living at that time. Now, here is the last 542 million years of geologic history. So this would be today, where we are today, this would be 542 million years ago. These large spikes that you see here that would be classified as our major. Here's the Permian extinction event, guys. The one that was caused by global warming <laughs> triggered by volcanism. Uh, here's the dinosaur extinction event, and then it, it, it doesn't look that major here, but, but once again, uh, if we look at this peak right here, that last peak is that Ice Age extinction event when, when we came out of the last Ice Age about 11,000 years ago. So here, when a lot of that life was still confined to the oceans, any cha changes in the oceanic realm would have had profound impacts on the life living at that time. So we can see, guys, that extinction events are fairly common. They're, they're not rare. Extinction events are common, 
And if we talk to Darwin about this, guys, remember, your environment changes. You have two things you can do. You can adapt or you can go extinct. Those are your choices, guys. You can't adapt quick enough and you're going to go extinct because the changes you simply can't handle. Now, this is the end of our evolution discussion, guys. Um, the nice thing is, is we talked about the, th the theoretical underpinnings of evolution today. What we're going to do in our next discussion is we're going to look at something called historical geology. We're going to look at how life actually changed over our entire history. And so now that we have the theory under our belts, now we're actually going to look at the mechanisms of how life has changed. And so that'll be our next topic.